Mid-60s Los Angeles was probably the most eclectic musical city in the Western world, and with all the music studios, musicians from everywhere flocked to the City of Angels. One band whose original members were from LA was Love. We're going to look at their impressive body of work here on Pop Goes the 60s. Well, I just got out my little red book the minute that you said goodbye. And if you see me again, please don't forget to tell me that you love me. She comes in colors Yeah, a little funny thing Today, folk rock is often looked at as some kind of passing fad in between uh, British invasion, the Beatles coming to America, and the psychedelic craze of the later 60s. And usually when people talk about folk rock, you have these images of these guys with puddin' bowl haircuts to the backdrop of Mr. Tambourine Man by the Birds. But really it was a lot more than that, and there was a lot more progression going on within the folk rock period. And labels started to take risks on certain bands, and one of those labels was Elektra, and one of those bands was Love. The origins of Love started at Dorsey High School in Los Angeles with two former Memphis transplants, that being Johnny Eccles and Arthur Lee. Now, John Eccles played in a band in high school with various members, and some of those members included Henry Vestine, Billy Preston, Marilyn McCoo, Ron Townsend, Clarence McDonald, and eventually Arthur Lee joined. Now, Arthur was, he didn't have as much musical background as the other guys did, and he played accordion and, and organ, but they already had Billy Preston in the group, so he came in on bongos and conga drum. And once Billy Preston started to make a name for himself, he left school early to pursue his musical career. Arthur took over on keyboards, though he was really nowhere near Billy Preston's talent. Members of this band came and went. Henry Vestine left to play the blues. Marilyn McCoo left to go to UCLA. Clarence McDonald went to Cal State. John Eccles joined Billy Preston in Little Richard's band for a European tour where they met the Beatles in 1962. The remaining members, headed by Arthur Lee and John Eccles, formed a group called the LAGs, kind of a knockoff of Booker T and the MGs, and they recorded a couple singles. One of the ones they recorded was a song for Rosalie Brooks, which also featured a very young Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> That was Jimi Hendrix's first professional recording in the studio. And around the same time, Billy Preston had headed up a group called the Soul Brothers, and they became the house band at a place called the California Club. And he had bumped into Hendrix there as well. So a lot of these musicians got to know each other. And Hendrix had met Little Richard on the Chitlin circuit, so everybody was acquainted with each other and their playing. Inspired by the Beatles, the LAGs changed their name to the American Four. And this featured Arthur Lee, John Eccles, John Fleckenstein, and John Jacobson. So you had two black guys and two white guys, and they, they would wear like beetle type wigs, and they recorded a few singles. <laughs> By the summer of 1964, Brian Epstein had forwarded tickets for the Beatles concert at the Hollywood Bowl to Billy Preston, and Billy took Johnny Eccles along, and Eccles realized that these were the guys that they saw back in England. This was the impetus to really continue as a band and to push forward into new territory. Now, by 1965, the Birds were the kings of L.A., and the American Four decided to update their name to something more folk rockish, to the grassroots, and this name was inspired by Malcolm X. Now, one of the other members that they picked up along this time was a guitar player. His name was Bobby Boussoulet, who later became associated with the Manson family and uh, got himself into a little bit of trouble. By August 1965, Boussoulet became expendable when they were introduced to Brian McLean. Now, Brian McLean did some folk singing. He had been touring with the Birds as a roadie, and he's a pretty good guitar player, and he asked to sit in with the group and the group really clicked with him. He joined the band almost immediately, and one of the things about McLean, and coming from Los Angeles, he had a little bit of a Hollywood background. His father was an architect to some of the stars, and he worked with such celebrities as Dean Martin and Liz Taylor. In fact, McLean learned to swim in Liz Taylor's swimming pool, and his first girlfriend was Liza Minnelli. And Brian McLean had a small part in a Hollywood film called An Affair to Remember with Deborah Carr and Cary Grant. <laughs> 
Brian McLean started playing professionally in 1963, and he started playing at the Balladeer in West Hollywood, which eventually became the Troubadour. He was known for his finger-picking guitar style, and a little bit more of a folk and bluegrass background, and he had even tried out for the Monkees, but didn't make it. So he was at loose ends, he was looking for a band to join, and he found one. Things started to move when Brian joined the band, they got a gig at A Brave New World, which was a club that uh, they started to pack. And McLean, with his Birds connections, brought all those followers to this club, so the grassroots started getting really big. And one night, John Eccles and Brian McLean were sitting around, and a guy came up to them who happened to be Lou Adler. And Johnny Eccles tells the story. Adler was drunk, and he had a, a woman with him he was trying to impress. So he goes up to these two guys and says, hey, you know, you guys are great. I can make you guys stars. You're going to be big, blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, you'll have to talk to our manager because, you know, we've got some representation. And Adler took this very bad. It was a big affront. He said, you'll never work in this town again. Do you know who you're talking to? That kind of thing. So he goes away. And then a month later, there's a 45 release locally by a group called The Grassroots. And this was released by Adler. And he released the song, Ballad of a Thin Man, the Dylan song. So all the grassroots followers are like, is this you guys? We heard your new record. They're like, that's not us. So they realized that Adler took a popular local band and released a 45 under that name, knowing he'd get some chart access, uh, success right off the bat, kind of got back at those guys. So the, the, the group, the real group, Grassroots, actually had the legal right to sue, but they decided, you know what, maybe it's time we change our name at this point anyway. And they changed their name to Love. So the members at this time consisted of Arthur Lee on vocals and percussion, Johnny Eccles lead guitar, Brian McLean guitar, John Fleckenstein on bass, and Don Conica on drums. Now they really didn't have proper management and they did not have a recording contract, but they had uh, a friend named Ronnie Heron. She was an aspiring actress and a publicist for Elmer Valentine, who was the owner of the Whiskey A Go-Go. She thought she could help the band out, and though she didn't have any management experience, she had lots of connections, so the band hired her. The band's popularity really started to grow during this period, and several record companies showed interest. Among them were Columbia, Warners, RCA, and Capitol, and they all offered contracts, but none of them offered publishing. And their association with Little Richard, Richard always said, get your publishing. So that was one of the things that they were really holding out for. They could have got more money from these other companies, but the one company that did allow them to keep their publishing was Elektra. And Elektra had never, well, this was technically their second rock band. The first rock band they hired, which was very recent, was the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. And Elektra wanted a break into rock and Love was the first legitimate rock band that they signed. Now, Jack Holtzman of Elektra got in contact with the band really through Frank Zappa. They were friends with Zappa, and he helped facilitate a meeting, and that's how Holtzman got involved and watched them play and watched their live show and thought they had mediocre material but really did some interesting things with it. Love signed a record contract with Elektra in January of 1966. They already were looking at changing a couple of band members, the main one being Don Conca on drums. He had developed a pretty good drug habit, and he was out to be replaced by Albin Fisterer. Albin's nickname was Snoopy, and he was a keyboardist, really, but he joined on drums. And John Fleckenstein needed a little more steady paycheck, so he went into film but he also joined the Standells in 1967 before resuming his film career, where he worked eventually with Steven Spielberg on the film E.T. To replace Fleckenstein, who played bass, they brought in Ken Forsey, formerly of the Safaris. Immediately their sound changed because Forsey's bass, he had a hollow-bodied bass and it had a, an interesting sound to it, so this, their sound continued to improve. Right off the start, the contract stipulated that Arthur Lee be paid everything and then he would distribute money to the members. So here at the very beginning, he was taking this authoritarian approach where he was going to be in charge. And he was starting to get a reputation for, me, for being difficult to work with. And the band started working at places like the Brave New World, Hullabaloo, Beetleitos, and the Sea Witch. And as they started to prepare for their first recordings, Electra designer Bill Harvey designed a logo for them. Now this is the first album. And as they started to prepare for this album, it was basically their, their live set. 
And they had one song that really impressed Holtzman, and that was My Little Red Book. Well, I just got out my little red book the minute that you said goodbye. My Little Red Book hit number 52 on Billboard and number 35 in Cashbox. And this became, eventually became like a proto-punk standard, a garage classic. And it was inf influential on the Velvet Underground, as well as Pink Floyd, who based the riff of Interstellar Overdrive on this song. So Lee really liked this song. He saw it in the movie, What's New Pussycat? And it was being sung by Manford Mann. So they just transformed it and made it into this garage classic that we know today. Now those songs do not sound very garagey, but those are more folk rocky. And this whole album is, I would say, is, has a very folk rock feel to it overall. Emotions is a very strong song instrumentally, and they started to get some gigs uh, on television at this point, too, on the strength of the single. They've got some very strong songs on this album, but they're, it's their first try, and there are a couple weak songs as well, like this one, which sounds like a clone of Hey Joe. Now they also cover Hey Joe on this album, and that, was, that song was all the rage in the clubs, and that was one of the most popular numbers to play live. And this album got to number 57 on Billboard, which is very respectable, actually, and sold 150,000 copies, most in the Southern California area. Now, one of the things that has been said over the years is that this was shot at Bella Lugosi's old house, which is not true. This was the remnants of a burned out house with the remaining fireplace standing. This album is considered a folk rock album, but really it, it it's a little bit further than that. Some of the music is a little more uh, outside of the typical folk, folk rock sound, and some of the instrumentation sounds uh, a little more mysterious. And of course, there's that garagey element on a couple songs too. So David Crosby kind of offered some advice and said, look guys, you're gonna have to develop your sound more if you wanna stand out, because they did sound very Bird's derivative. So that was one thing they took to heart. By April 1966, the Birds had already had several big hits, and Love took over as kind of the darlings of the Sunset Strip, and the popularity moved northward to San Francisco, where they started to play regularly at the Fillmore. And there was always a rivalry between L.A. and San Fran, and for some reason, San Francisco seemed to adopt this band, Love, a little bit more than other L.A. bands. And one of the things that made them interesting is you had a black guy that sounded white, you know, so that was rather unusual. And the psychedelic scene was really in its infancy, so Love fit right into that. Now with Love starting to make a little bit of money, they started to get some better digs to live in and they moved to Laurel Canyon. This is the time when all these young bands were moving into the canyon area because it was close to the Strip, it was close to Hollywood, it was cheap, and a lot of musicians and other artists lived there, so it was a great community to be a part of. The band started to play at the Whiskey A Go Go, which was a bigger venue, and Ronnie found them an old mansion to live in. And Love had to just pay the taxes because the original owners, they weren't living there anymore. And it was originally built by Maurice Tournier, who was a silent movie director, and this whole castle built up the mystique of the band. One of the cool things about this period were all the musicians congregating together in the canyon, and one up and coming group were the Doors, and they befriended Love and Brian McLean and Johnny Eccles were pretty close with Jim Morrison. And they brought him along to Arthur's house once, and Arthur got angry because Morrison was swimming naked in his pool, and Arthur kicked him out. So Arthur always had a beef with somebody or something, but still they, these bands got along really well, and the Doors really looked up to Love. And at this same point, Love was really getting disillusioned and was not very happy with Elektra's handling of them. Elektra had, this was really their first rock group. They didn't really have a good handle on promoting this band and the distribution wasn't as good for them to 
tour outside of the southern Los Angeles area. So they thought by offering the doors to Electra that would be suitable compensation to let Love out of their contract. Well, they did do that, but Electra wouldn't let him out of the contract. And Jack Holtzman did go and see the doors. And after a couple times, you know, I think the first time or two, Morrison may have been drunk. And they kept convincing him to go check him out. And then Morrison was on good behavior. And Holtzman signed the doors. Now, the band was gearing up for their follow-up album that was to be called De Capo. And this was going to be produced by Paul Rothschild and engineered by Bruce Botnick and Dave Hassinger. And at this point, they made another lineup change in the group Love. And they moved Snoopy to keyboard, which was his natural instrument. And they brought in a drummer called Michael Stewart, who had been in the Sons of Adam. And they also added Jay Cantrelli, a jazz saxophone and flutist, to add some different type of textures to their sound. So these additions allowed the band to go into more of a jazz fusion direction, a little, just a jazzier approach, which is a little bit new for them, certainly. But I think it was starting to reflect Arthur's writing a lot, and the combination was really good. If I don't start crying, it's because I have got no eyes. My Bible's in the Bible. So that song was their next single, Seven and Seven Is, and that became uh, even a bigger hit. That was number 33. So they seem to be moving here in the right direction. And that song was written by Arthur about a high school girlfriend, and they both had the same birthday, March 7th. Now, Kenny Forsey deserves some credit on this song, although he didn't receive any, and it's for the bass playing. So he had these great sliding bass notes, these octaves he was using that really made the song very unique sounding. So Love signed an endorsement with Vox, and they got these Super Beatle amplifiers, and that's where that fuzz tone comes from. Now, Ken Forsey played an echo bass with a semi-acoustic cutout in it, and that's what helped give it that distortion. And Botnick and Holzman really fought the band on that distortion. They didn't want that on the record, but the band loved it, so they won out. And this, this song was kind, kind of a, another somewhat of a landmark song, having this super hard edge to it with this, this wild bass in it, ending with this huge explosion before it has a, this peaceful ending with this kind of bluesy coda. So those three songs really show an advancement in their sound. So they did take David Crosby's advice and came up with their own sound, and they certainly did on those songs. Orange Skies was written by Brian McLean. So you had uh, quite a, a variety of writers here at this point in the band, and McLean, who was also a good singer and player, was a good foil for Arthur Lee. Now the song She Comes in Colors was Arthur's song, and he thought the Stones ripped him off, because later on they did... Um, She's a rainbow where they have the line, she comes in colors. So Lee thought the Stones ripped him off on at least two occasions, and that was one of them. With nickels and dimes, you soon will have a dollar. KV, though, was the follow-up single, and it didn't chart, unfortunately. And Botnick told Arthur, he said, hey, you're a black man trying to sing like a white man who's trying to be black. And uh, they said Arthur never sounded black, but writer Richie Unterberger suggested that he sounded like a psychedelic Johnny Mathis. Ow. Now for the song Stephanie Knows Who, the, there was a problem in the band because when the song was being written by Arthur, he was seeing this girl named Stephanie, but by the time it was recorded, she was seeing Brian McLean. So you had this, uh, this fighting over a girl in here, and this started to put a wedge between the two principal songwriters here between McLean and Arthur Lee. And there was even talk, Arthur was, I think at this point, content to get Brian out of the band, but the rest of the band vetoed that. So Jay Cantrelli's addition to the group really allowed the band to go a little more in a jazz direction, to open up a little bit more. And they had a song that they did, originally they entitled it John Lee Hooker, but for their album was called Revelations, and it took up the whole side of an album. Say it sweet, say it sweet, all right, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they would stretch off for a whole hour on stage with just this song, and it would allow them to 
essentially just become that jam band that they were working at being. And the jazz guys like Charles Lloyd and Gabor Sabo would sit in with them occasionally. So they started to get some recognition from jazz guys, which gave them some pretty solid street cred. So this is the second album, Da Capo. And I don't understand why anybody would have a photo shoot for consecutive albums at the same location, but that is the same location. Don't know why they did that. But this album is a fantastic album, except for they wasted a whole side of the album with this Revelations, this long, drawn-out song, which maybe it's on great live. I guess he had to be there in the club, but on record, it didn't really come off very well. So the first side is excellent, and the second side is probably more of an acquired taste. Arthur Lee was basically the manager of the group, but he wasn't really cut out to be a manager. He was difficult to work with, and this started to make problems within the band. So with Da Capo, the new lineup would have sounded great live. I don't know that there's many live recordings of it, but with Jay Cantrelli on flute and saxophone, those were actually mic'd, so it was good and loud, and it added a really nice texture, but unfortunately the band didn't play live a lot at this point, and part of the reason was they said that Electra wasn't really able to promote them properly, and the Electra said, well, you're not playing live anyway, so that's not gonna help sell the album. So there was kind of this standoff between the two factions. An example of this is like they, they get asked to play at Arizona in the Phoenix area, and they would do a little research and they just didn't have the pre-promotion, records weren't in the shops, so they decided instead of spending the money on the travel, that they would just play more dates in Southern California, which is where they were really known, and they were drawing really good crowds. The other thing was that Arthur Lee, he just didn't like to tour. He was a bit of a dandy, so he didn't like eating crap food on the road, which you have to do when you're just starting out. So those were some of the things that held the band back from really breaking out of the Southern California area in a bigger way. So there was another issue that kept them from taking bookings, and that had to do with who was headlining. So Arthur Lee insisted upon headlining. Now there were several groups that would allow Love to headline, even though maybe these other groups started having bigger hits, like The Doors, for example, or Iron Butterfly, or Big Brother. And there was a very good camaraderie between the bands, so oftentimes this was not an issue, but sometimes it was an issue. And contractually, sometimes bands were signed to close shows, so if Love couldn't close the show, Arthur would oftentimes back out. Now they did tour in some places. Texas was very receptive to love. A lot of the southern communities and southern states didn't want to deal with a mixed race group. I mean, the band sounded white. So some of these, some people didn't even realize that you had a couple of black guys in the band, three really with uh, Jay Cantrelli. And uh, that was an issue. And you had to sometimes segregate the audiences. So love stayed away from that. Arthur Lee didn't want to deal with any of that. And that was one of the other reasons he didn't like being on the road. But Texas was a very good draw for them, particularly in Dallas, and they really worked to get proper distribution of the records there, so those tours seemed to work out. Now, making matters worse between Elektra and Love is that Love was pushing the, the record label to terminate their contract. Again, I mentioned earlier, they had offered the doors and brought them into the fold of Elektra, and they thought that that might be adequate compensation for letting Love out of their contract. Love even went so far to have a verbal deal with MCA, who did offer to buy them out of their Electra contract, but Electra wouldn't allow it. So I assume that Electra just felt that there was still gas in the tank for Love, and they just held them to the contract. And they really had another two albums or so contractually that they had to produce. The timing of these squabbles was really bad for Love. De Capo was released in November of 66, and by the time The Doors album, their first album was released, which was January 67, that album started to gain momentum right away. And the money that would have spent on promoting Love, Electra started using it to promote The Doors because that was started to be a runaway success. Even though the first single didn't really do well, that was a break on through to the other side, that basically tanked. But the second single, Light My Fire, became a number one song. Now, despite The Doors having a number one record, they oftentimes would defer to Love and allow Love to take top billing. So here you have a situation where The Doors are exuding some class here, not a term often associated with Jim Morrison, but that was still the reputation of Love and Arthur Lee. And uh, as 67 moved on and things got closer to the summer of Love, we had the Monterey Pop Festival come up. Now, Love was probably the second most popular band 
to not go to the Monterey Pop Festival or to refuse to go, the first being the Beach Boys, of course. And they were not looked at as a typical Los Angeles band. Brian McLean said of missing the Monterey show that that's when they missed the boat. So I think the Beach Boys felt the same way in, in retrospect. So that was a, it was a big deal to be at that. And again, Arthur Lee's pride got in the way. He wanted to close one of the nights or something. I'm not even quite sure. They blamed it on money at some point, but that's not true because none of the bands were to be paid. They were gonna get money to go to their, to get them to Monterey and then money to get them to their next gig. But I don't think anybody was really taking payments. So I think Arthur Lee was just having a little bit of one of his little fits, and they ended up not playing that very important show. By September 1967, Arthur had moved out of the castle and moved into the house where Roger Corman's cult film, The Trip, was shot. It was called The Trip House. So he was living there, which was in Laurel Canyon, and the band started to rehearse there for what was to become their magnum opus. The Summer of Love would see the band moving on from drugs like LSD and marijuana to drugs like cocaine and heroin. And there was a little bit of an allure to those drugs because jazz musicians had used them and had started writing under the influence of those intoxicants. And it was under this condition that they started working on their next album, which we're going to be covering in part two here on Pop Goes the 60s. Ba, 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 yeah. 